What fascinates us about the Chicago mob? Pretty much everything. That's why we talk about it. We talk about the bad guys. We talk about the badge guys. Sam tried to go straight. How long do you think that was? An hour and a half? Yeah, that <laughs> we talk about the guys behind bars and the betrayers of Omerta buried in a shallow grave. We talk about the guys who sang and we crow about the guys who flew the coop. We talk about the guys that got shot up, banged up, and blown up. We spill about the heists, the skims, and the double crosses, and the double double crosses. We talk with the survivors, and we take you inside the Chicago outfit on the VPod network, Fridays and Saturdays, 8.30 p.m. Central Time. You better watch if you know what's good for you. Welcome to episode six of Inside the Chicago Outfit on the VPod Network. I'm James Enzo Forney, the show co-founder and producer, and I'm here with my esteemed colleagues and mobologists. Camille's Robinson, contributing writer. I'm Joey Seifert, author of Deadly Associates and co-producer. Paul Whitcomb, contributing writer on Inside the Chicago Outfit. In episode one, we opened the entire series of Inside the Chicago Outfit with a look at Sam Giancana. Today on episode six, we're gonna focus on another Sam, not maybe as well known, but certainly well known to mobologists, and that is one Samuel Battaglia. So let's start off and talk about Sam Battaglia. How did he get his start? And uh, he was also a 42? Right, yes. Battaglia was part of a large Sicilian family. They came over and initially settled in Kenosha and large family. They moved down to Chicago with a bunch of other cousins. There was a whole clan of Bataglias. And if you look, there are Bataglias all over the country. There's a, a made guy out of uh, Utica. There's one, in, I believe, in the Bonanno family. It was a family that was well spread out. It was a common name. So the Bataglias set up in the Sicilian section of, well, of Chicago and uh, Taylor Street, but they were a Sicilian enclave. Battaglia didn't get his initial start with the 42s, though. He was tied in with a family called the Jennas, the, uh, the terrible Jenna brothers, who were the Sicilian powerhouses in Chicago. They were apart from Al Capone. Eventually, Capone's men wiped them out as part of the melee of the 20s. But Sam was younger. He had two older members of the family who may have been brothers, may have been cousins. It's sort of up in the air, uh, Augie and Paul. And... They did a lot of grunt work for the Jennas. The Jennas had huge rackets in, in lottery. They had uh, distill, they distilled their own alcohol. They were, they were making quite a bit of money and they were well known in their community. As the Jennas were executed, the Bataglia saw the writing on the walls. They moved into other areas and that was how Sam got in with the 42s. His older cousin or brother, Paul, had a few outfit connections and he sort of was a go-between and in a leadership role with the 42s not exactly tied in with them but he served as a as a meet intermediary with the outfit and so sam is an up-and-coming member of the 42s he's big into rackets and strong arms and smashing cars into store windows and everything that, that you tie them to just this the violence the melee and getting into gambling even at a young age. So Sam started off, he bounced around from organization to organization to organization with his, within his family and really had his criminal upbringing with a bunch of different groups, mainly staying with, with Sicilians until it was no longer prudent to do so. And then he branched out with the 42s and it was there that he made his contacts with guys like Marshall Caifano and Milwaukee Phil Aldericio and he also became a contemporary of Sam Giancana. So all, all four of those guys were 42s. They were all uh, running in sim similar packs and, and were r running rackets and eventually learned the juice game, learned gambling, learned all of the, uh, mastered the apprenticeship of the Chicago outfit at, at that time. A terribly dangerous, all four of them. Paul Battaglia, as a matter of fact, met his end because he was robbing Capone protected establishments. And he was warned several times he made it past Al Capone's death, but as soon as Frank Nitti came over, 
they put a bullet through the head of Paul Battaglia. So he was the first of the four brothers, cousins, uh, to meet his end in a violent way, but not the last. Yeah, as, as we would certainly come to find out that Sam uh, was also capable of meeting other people's ends. So let's, let's talk a little bit about his history. What, uh, what was his primary occupation, would you say, uh, when he was working for the outfit? What was really interesting about Sam, and a lot of people might not understand this, Sam started out as a loan shark. You say, well, if they all did. Not really. At that time, loan sharking, juice loans, was really a Jewish racket. And that's biblical. I mean, you, if you remember back, Jesus threw the money lenders out of the temple. They were lending money. If you go back to the Merchant of Venice and Shakespeare, uh, Shylock was a money lender, and that was so frowned. That was the only jobs that the Jews could have in Italy, and that was so frowned upon by the by the merchants and and everyone else in Venice. So the Italians really frowned on that, and that continued forward into into the New World, into America. The Jews really had the had the Jewish gangsters really had the market corner, the monopoly, if you will, on loaning money. They usually had an Italian overseeing them because that was that was the way things are going. But at this time, there was a real transition as Italians flooded in. They were taking over the rackets from the Jewish gangsters, and with a few exceptions, uh, Meyer Lansky and, and others. But so when Sam Battaglia took over and started as a loan shark, it really wasn't being done by an Italian first off and at the level he was doing it. So Battaglia starts loaning out money and loaning out money and, and soon he, he grows an enormous book of, of, of money out there. He's got money all over. And Sam Battaglia is tremendously violent when it comes to collections. He will, he will beat you to death, he will kill you if, it, if, it, if you're not paying him rather than, rather than smack you around or do whatever in order to get his money. He'll, he'll just kill you. And this is, you're talking about chasing guys down the streets, screaming and yelling, beating them in the middle of the streets, the, the things you see in movies. That was Gene Con. I mean, that, I'm sorry, that was Battaglia, foaming at the mouth, just violent, fists first, beating, beating the hell out of these guys. So, and Battaglia also, he, he had a base of operation, right? Wasn't it uh, the Casa Madrid where he would bring people or they would have people brought to him who weren't making their juice payments? As the outfit grew, Battaglia would eventually move on to work for a guy named Rocco de Grazia. Grazia was a link to that old Capone organization. Grazia was a Capone guy, and he actually owned the, the Casa Madrid, which, which is in, uh, was in uh, Melrose Park. Yeah, the building is still there. It's, it's been through a couple iterations, but it is still there. Looks more or less the exact same. So Battaglia is an up-and-comer. He's, he's a real young Turk. And he works for this de Grazia, who was the area boss of, of Melrose Park. And yeah, they would drag people into the basement. And Battaglia really earned a reputation for his violence because he would, he would just drag these guys down and he would hold a court. And there was really only one verdict. So, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of a court. And he's, he's beating, he would just beat guys, he would kill them. And people would question, what, Sam, what are you doing? What are you doing to these guys? They owe you money. And Sam, through his thick Chicago slash Sicilian accent, couldn't pronounce th. The th sound was you trip over. It's t t t. So he's going to bust you and put the plural of a word usually is with an s. So I'm going to bust you in your teats, meaning you know go brush your teats. But it was. His, and that became his nickname, his moniker, right? Teats Battaglia. Teats Battaglia, because he wanted to bust you in the teats. Even among outfit guys, that sounded ridiculous. Right. What we see is a pattern of, of how to extort money, just the way that in the future Giancana learned uh, about the uh, policy wars from somebody else. These guys are looking to another culture to say, oh, hey, why, you know. Sam didn't read his Shakespeare. He didn't care about the <laughs> Merchant of Venice or Shylock. He said, here's a way to make money and I'm going to just start doing it. And it was so much easier than the way he started out. I mean. Teets Battaglia was a huge a hulk of a teenager. And the way he came onto the public scene was he decided to commit an armed robbery of the wife of the mayor of Chicago, Pig Bill, Bill Thompson's wife. And she had a full-time police bodyguard. He robbed her of $15,500 of jewelry in broad daylight, wow. disarmed her police escort, and took his badge. That's how he became a member of the Chicago public scene. 
Sure. So that, he was. That, that's that's bold. That's real bold. <laughs> Can you imagine that's that a, today? That's a getter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Big Bill Thompson is a character. Only, I mean, he was tied <clears throat> in with the Capone mob until they got tired of him. And then for a brief time, they supported uh, Cermak. But Big Bill Thompson once held a press conference said he was going to invade Mexico, and so he was boarding a ship down the Mississippi River. I mean, Big Bill Thompson was was. Uh, a buffoon is how most people describe him, but he was a lunatic, and he was sort of, for a while, Chicago was like, well, he's our lunatic, but he was he was a real crazy, over-the-top, I guess you could say populist kind of guy, but he was he would just say ridiculous things. I, I, like, the Mexico thing is the first thing coming to my mind, but I think that you could cap it at there. I'm invading Mexico and getting on my cruise ship. Down. And in fairness, he was a Republican. <laughs> we were giving a hard time in our last episode to a Democrat. <laughs> That's right. But, uh, and, and the interesting thing about that is in this brazen robbery of the mayor's wife, right in front of the police officer and the mayor's wife, he was arrested but released for lack of evidence. Amazing. Isn't that something? In possession of the badge, but no, no, no evidence. Well, he just found it. Yeah. Fell off the back of a truck. So that was uh, certainly uh, <clears throat> influenced by uh, the Chicago outfit, I'm sure, to get his, the Taglia's release. Uh, but that was not the only time he was indicted, right? No, no. He got caught. Uh, he robbed a high-stakes poker game, and someone tipped off the police. And he was, in fact, caught. There was a shootout. People were hurt. Uh, and he did wind up the only one that didn't get away. So his charmed life was not perfect like some of the others, that he was not the Teflon Don that some were, but he shot a policeman. Well, that's, yeah, that's a high, that's a crime that is not well thought of in, in any city, especially Chicago. So was it back think. then, though? That was, I mean, I know it's different now, but back then. Even back then. Time. Well, I mean, you know, it's often said that the biggest gang in Chicago was the Chicago Police Department. Well, sure, if you got a badge. Yeah. Yeah. And if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about it is that when uh, Battaglia was arrested, his attorney was somebody that I think we'll all recognize by the name of Sidney Korshak. Yeah, Korshak would go on to, he was, I think of a guy named Roy Cohn who would become the mobster to the stars. Sidney Korshak was that figure years before he went out to L.A. and he was the clean mob face to Hollywood, to the unions to everybody. City Korshak was the power broker of power brokers on the West Coast. He had the Teamsters, he had everybody, and he had a direct line to guys like Gus Alex and, and Ricardo and everything. They completely controlled him, and he was worth millions when he died. He, everybody knew him. He was that guy, but he was the outfit guy. But he was, he was defending Battaglia. Yes, he was. <laughs> and he, he went Sorry, to understood. Hollywood and never even obtained a California law license but wielded enormous power. He had clients from everybody, up, including Ronald Reagan. Right, because his, his name was famous all the way through. Famous. Yeah, to the 80s um, and beyond. So uh, what era uh, are we talking about now? Is, are we in uh, when he's first put a, you know, first... Well, What it, era are we talking about when he's first convicted? The most important, probably, thing that happened now, we're talking about the 30s, the 40s. Uh, it was 1930 when he robbed the mayor's wife. But as we get into the 40s, he is granted by Tony Accardo an extra large territory, an unusually large crew, because he is earning so much money. As Camillus explained, this guy is a gifted loan shark. And he, people were always willing to take the money. They weren't, for whatever reason, they weren't concerned about the method of collection, which was the word was out. If you didn't pay Sam Battaglia, you were in a a lot of trouble. But Accardo gave him this enormous territory, and so it was widely expected among people in the outfit that when Accardo retired, Sam Battaglia would be taking the, the chair, not Sam Giancana. That's how powerful he had become by 1955, 1956. Were Battaglia and Giancana rivals? In a sense, they were, but they were both 42s. Yeah. Giancana was an earlier 42, but he came in later, and so that the, uh, Battaglia was part of that West Side group, but he had m massive power on his own, and he didn't—he did not really want the top spot. 
because he knew the heat that came with it. And he realized that it was really going to be Tony Accardo and Paul Rica that were calling the shots, that he was the lightning rod. Mm -hmm. At this time, you have a lot of these young guys, Aldericio and, and Caifano and, and Battaglia and Fiore Buccieri and, and Gene Cana, who are really building their own operations. So it wasn't so much that there was rivalry between them. They, there wasn't this shoot for the top. I think that Gene Cana probably wanted it more than anyone. Maybe Buccieri wanted the position also. But a lot of them were happy where they were making money and not getting that spotlight. Yeah. They had come up under Capone. They had seen what happens at the top. You know, Rika went to prison, so <laughs> Nitty was dead. Uh, they had seen a lot of what goes on, and Accardo had kept his head down, but he was starting to get some attention on him in the 50s. So prior to that, a lot of these guys didn't... Why would you want the increased uh, attention, the increased responsibility, when you can have a place like Melrose Park that you've got on lockdown? You've, you've got the mayor, you've got the chief of police, you've got the police force who will arrest people at your command... And he's by this point he's supplemented he's 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 taken over for his boss uh, Rocco De Grazia. De Grazia is now sort of in the background. That that's more of that new outfit taking over for the the Capone era. But there's no push to be the boss. That just I think there's an idea that they want to get to the top. But why? Who wants the headache? Nobody wants that. It's heavy yeah. as the head. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. You don't. And and you're you're already uh, you're running your own fiefdom anyway. There might be some you know friction here and there, but. You're, mm -hmm. you're making good bank. You've got anything you want, anytime you want. You're in the you, sweet spot. You're fearless, except when the federal government comes calling, which they do in the mid to late 50s, which was the McClellan right. Committee. So let's talk about what, what is that for the viewers. A lot of people know about the stuff that happened with Hoffa and uh, Witchie and Kana in the 60s mm -hmm. with RFK. But Robert Kennedy was working with a... Was a senator or governor? Senator, senator right? Senator. senator McClellan from Arkansas. What? What? Uh, what? Why? First of all, why was there a committee put together? It was. There was an investigation into organized labor. There was a look at the the organized. That that's really what a lot of people think it was the mob hearings. It was. It was organized labor and the role that crime was taking in organized labor. There had been a journalist, Victor Riesel, who was writing about corruption and a New York gangster named Johnny Diagardi, and Johnny Diagardi and Hoffa had gotten together and set up paper unions in order to fudge roles to make, to put Hoffa in the presidency of the Teamsters, and a lot of things, and Victor Riesel wrote about it and had acid thrown in his face and was blinded. And that, and a lot of other things, served as the catalyst for these national hearings where this senator set them up, he wanted to look into the power that labor was was gaining in America. And you have Bobby Kennedy, who was at this time a young prosecutor and who was working for the center, who was the lead prosecutor on the McClellan hearings. And it really is kind of disingenuous to see this millionaire Bobby Kennedy talking about how corrupt the working class is. And I don't, that doesn't really sit well nowadays, but back then it was you know, this idea that, oh, the labor, you know, they have too much power in this country, which they did. Hoffa could snap his fingers and, and shut down transportation, period. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of these labor leaders, George Meany from the AFL-CIO and Dave Beck from the Teamsters, Jimmy Hoffa from the Teamsters, back and forth with Bobby Kennedy. And you get a lot of mobsters from around the country. And Sam Battaglia was there going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kennedy himself. He was called, yeah, before them. And, and yes. what, what was uh, Sam's strategy? Did he sing like a bird like uh, Willie uh, in, in Hollywood did? No. Uh, Murray Humphreys, who we've mentioned quite a bit, had trained basically every mobster in the country to take the Fifth Amendment. Now, they sort of struggled with the wording, so they'd keep the card. And even with the card, Battaglia couldn't quite get it right. Yeah, no. What, what was the famous turn of phrase he couldn't get right? I refuse. He said, I refuse to testify. And they said, I, I think you mean decline. He said, what? Decline. <laughs> And then he's like, what's, what's all the this? difference? I'll punch you in the teeth. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's this decline, refuse? It's a word, right? They're both words. <laughs> he said, could you show a little bit more contempt? He's like, well, I don't know. What are you talking? Right, exactly. So they asked him to change his testimony to say, I decline. Okay, yeah, sure, decline. And how many times did he uh, decline? 60. Six zero. 60 times he muddled his way through that. But the list of questions 
is kind of amazing when you listen between the committee chairman McClellan and then Kennedy to to look at the list of questions. I mean, honestly, we should just read them out loud. It's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you know, were you there at you know when this person was killed? Did you know did, you know when this person was blown up? Did you do this? And he, they're you know he, he's denying everything. But by the time you're done hearing the whole list, you're like, wow. You sound like a bad guy. <laughs> you sound like you might have not been, uh, you know, the using the most scrupulous tactics to uh, get your money. Well, uh, think about the people that work directly for him. You know, Tony Accardo allowed him a lot of rain because he was so successful. And all the 42s that were still big in those days worked directly for Sam Battaglia. You know, Obi Fabrata, uh, Milwaukee Phil, Marshall Cafano, um, Jackie the Lackey. Uh, it, just, it just goes on and on. And these guys worked directly for Battaglia. He had enormous power. And they were all powerhouses themselves. They were all yeah. powerhouses yeah. themselves. And they laddered up to Sam. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did. And that's why inside the outfit, as Accardo decided he was going to step back, that everyone thought it was going to be Battaglia. And Battaglia did not sing, really. He, no. he, he, uh, he kept uh, to the omerta. He didn't say anything. He did. And, and at that time, they, the government hadn't figured out a strategy to go around that, to, no. to allow them to not impugn themselves through the fifth. They were, you know. Right. So there was no deal done. They just had to sit there and endure it and then list off what they thought his crimes were. Right, and that was the American public's first introduction. Now, of course, 50, and this was in the 50, early 50s, 1950, in 1930, he had been well introduced by his, uh, to the Chicago crowd because of what he did to the mayor's wife, and yet he walked. So everybody knew that he was connected, that he was ruthless, but this was his nationwide debut. And with his violent outbursts and things, he wasn't, he wasn't a mild-mannered guy. I mean, there were lots of reports of him. Ch he would be stopped by the police and scream and cuss at them in point. So it wasn't so much that Battaglia kept his head down. It's just more that the government was so interested in Giancana because he did stupid things like, like date America's sweetheart. Battaglia wouldn't do that. He would find a young... <laughs> he, he found young girls that nobody knew about. And... So he just wasn't, didn't do foolish things. But he, was, he, he could have been Giancana as far as his behaviors and his actions and his outbursts. He just wasn't completely foolish. No, he was actually very smart. And in, in later uh, outfit history, you'll see that every time someone's arrested on the way to do a hit, and there were, this happened lots, it was never a car in their name. It was always a rental or it was in someone else's name. And that came from, because Sam Battaglia in the 30s was smart enough, well, that's actually in the, in the 40s, he was arrested in a car with three pistols, a shotgun, a hand grenade, and it was a rental car. So the police said, well, we can't really prove that you have possession of these things. Put all this in my car. <laughs> so, yeah, Me well, rental. You know, yeah. what, anyone could leave a hand grenade in the, in the car. It does happen. And so ever since then, you'll never see a car in the name of a mobster that is actually working. Mm -hmm. They don't do it. It's a rental car or it's in someone else's name. Correct, or, or dealer place. or Acme, yeah, yeah Acme yes. company. That's or, the Battaglia innovation. So if you're going to carry a hand grenade, yeah. make sure it's in a rental. Right. Does right. that still work nowadays, by no. the way? No. No, it doesn't work it's now. We have something. For legal. <laughs> we, we have constructive <laughs> possession now. He bought a lot of property. In, in episode five, we talked about the fact that we think that, I mean, Battaglia had a violent, obviously, violent past, and he was uh, with Caifano. Potentially, that's our theory, right? It's Caifano in the car with him when he got picked up with a hand grenade. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Was he on a booster seat? And and so what? So if we think about where uh, Battaglia ends ends up in 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 the future, and we'll draw the map, we have Giancana, mm -hmm. who preceded him, and then we have Saron who succeeds him, so he has a period in, in time, but really, again, across the top is Accardo, right? He's still the person behind all that. He's the consistent through line for decades in, in the uh, Chicago outfit. Um, and, and so what happens uh, to Battaglia between the time of McClellan and, and becoming the boss? Anything significant in that 
time frame, or is it just sure? Yeah. He, he expands into uh, legitimate businesses. He continues to run prostitution rings, the juice loans, the extortion, but he invests in legitimate businesses. Uh, he opens up uh, uh, taverns. They invest in real estate in Nevada and Arizona, and uh, they bought a huge industrial complex. I mean, millions of dollars was invested in legitimate business. Even uh, Twin Foods, which was a huge company, they had so much stock in it that they would regularly show up at board meetings. And this was yeah. his idea? Yeah. They own the company ISP, short for Irwin, Sam, and Phil Aldericio, his really original name. But as Paul said, they, he owned entire city blocks, city correct, that he collected income from with Milwaukee Phil. They owned in, an entire block that they would lease out, and he owned a farm up in Pingrove, Illinois, which is a tiny, tiny little community. There were maybe under 200 residents, and... Sam had hundreds of acres up there. He had hundreds of acres out towards Aurora. He had massive amounts of property everywhere that he went. And this little fiefdom up in Pingrove, everybody knew who he was. He started amassing hogs and trucks. He would go down to the market and pay triple what anybody else was paying for hogs so nobody could get their resources for their farm. What was he and using the hogs for? I think he was setting up a farm. He was trying to have legitimate, and he was feeding them bodies. But yeah, I mean, he eating was, bodies. Horses, yeah. And in Las Vegas, he sent Marshall Cofano out to Vegas with literally suitcases full of cash to invest. Well, before we get to that, we got to give Battaglia his due in a sense that he was ahead of his time. He was diversifying. Yes. Right? So now, so he sends Caifano to Vegas then, not right. to Hollywood. To it Vegas. Was, right. The Sahara was run by a guy, Mo Dalitz, out of Cleveland. He was a Jewish mobster. And Taglia and members of Chicago decided that they wanted in, so they basically went in and told Modalitz that he was out. And Cleveland went along with it. They had made their, their bit, and they didn't have much to say about it anyway. They, they just didn't have the size, so they forced Modalitz out. And Modalitz had three or four other casinos at the time. He, he was really Mr. Las Vegas. But they forced him out of the Sahara, and that was how Chicago really started getting their foothold into the... So the Sahara was the first one. Yeah. And then the Sands, the Riviera, yeah. the Tropicana. The Rev I'd heard, yeah. Don't mm -hmm. forget Circus Circus. Can't forget Circus Circus, <laughs> where Tony Spilatro had his little jewelry shop. Little Tony. Yes. You know who was a partner in that no. shop? My dad. No kidding. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. We're going to talk about that again. I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> and we will when we're talking about Aldericio as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because their partnerships extended into other legitimate businesses. Uh, Car dealerships was another one. Oh, yeah. What, one of my favorite stories about Battaglia is he had this huge car dealership. I think it was out on Cicero. And one night, somebody stole all 300 cars. Wow. In the course of one night. Turned it into insurance, made a huge amount of money, bankrupted the dealership, and off they went. There was another time a car dealer owed him money. Within, well, in the course of one day, 250-odd automobiles were sold. They were sold to outfit members, their, fa out, their family members, everybody. Gene kind of got his money, but there was, uh, that would lead to a later investigation of some uh, tax issues there because the cars were all sold for undervalue and the, the dealer couldn't expense it off, right? So he ended up getting in quite a bit of trouble for that. Gene Conner did. No, no, the, the, the car dealer, and then he would eventually sort of lead them to Battaglia. Another trail, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the IRS is always the, the one that's, uh, you know, leading the investigation before we get into any kind of, you know, uh, federal investigations other than McClellan. Right. It's always been the Treasury Department that's been, uh, you know, laying, casting the net to capture the, the mob. Until you have, um, you know, I guess if there is an innovation on the fed, federal side of the investigation and, and listening to Robert Kennedy talk about it, and the, the thing that he saw was that the different operating agencies within the government were not cooperating. This is not a big surprise right. to us. In these investigations, and he got something on the order of 26 different um, federal in, uh, departments to work together, including the post office, right? yes. which we know is a federal, there's automatic federal crime if you do something over state lines. So he, he saw that that was the way that they were going to be able to um, catch, 
cases that otherwise would not be snared if they didn't, unless they worked together. They were so diversified at one point in the early 50s, while the FBI is still denying that, that the mafia exists, the Bureau of Narcotics, which is the forerunner of, an, of the DEA, had, had a handbook this thick with the photograph of every mobster in the country. They knew who they were, they knew who they were affiliated with, but the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Right. So the FBI was still saying this, no such organization. Right. Yet, yet here they had all this data. It's still like that nowadays too sometimes. Yeah, yep. yep. To some degree, yeah, for, yeah. for, for other reasons, yeah, right. for the ego reasons and whatnot. So but, yeah. Bataglia had uh, pharmacies and he was uh, getting morphine and opium that he was selling on the side, anywhere this cat could make money, but yeah. so, yeah. So this is what's happening in the period after the investigation on his way up to, to become a boss. And what, what transpires from it? Now his tenure was, it wasn't super long, was no. it? Well, but, we talked about in prior episodes, Sam Giancana being called before a grand jury and immunized. And, and, and the short version of what that means is that he, no matter what he said, he could not be prosecuted for it. He was never in jeopardy. So you could not take the Fifth Amendment if you're never in jeopardy. Giancana refused to testify and he was jailed for contempt of court. So in 1965, the front boss is all of a sudden in the Cook County Jail. Accardo taps Sam Battaglia to step up while Giancana is incapacitated. And they don't know if it'll be a day, a week, a year. Right. At that point. Yeah, he pulls a cigar out and he says, I need another Sam. There's one. That's right. Battaglia, <laughs> step forward. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. And there's no indication Battaglia wanted anything to do with it. He had his own, like you said, his own fiefdom stacked with the, the biggest hitters in the outfit. He was making all kinds of money. He was investing it all around the United States. There was really no legitimate reason for him to want that spot. So he inherits it as a battlefield promotion. Giancana ends up going to Mexico, as we discussed. And so how long is he in, uh, in office for? Uh, so what's his term? Very short. Uh, he gets the extortion charge that we talked about. This began with the car dealership, 1967. So, so for 65, he's acting in place of Giancana. By 66, Giancana is released and flees to Mexico so Sam Battaglia becomes the street boss of the outfit, but he's only there until 67. He's indicted in 66, convicted in 67, and unfortunately for him, he dies in prison in 1973. Which is the ultimate fear for those guys, right? I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not that they could fear death in a, in a number of ways, but there was something about this notion of the indignity of dying in jail and. He's, we talked about Nitty, uh, you know, and, and suicide. Now we're talking about Vitaglia, a, a boss dying in jail. So, um, in a way, taking the leadership was a form of suicide for these guys. Mm -hmm. Well put. Giancana, Vitaglia, uh, Milwaukee Phil, they all wound up dead mm -hmm. in a very short order. Well, and we'll get to that with, with guys like. Uh, Lombardo, who uh, would have preferred not to have been at the top, and just keep running the running the rings, and and making bank while they're running every kind of scheme and extortion and whatnot. Why why do they need to to run the whole show? It's right. very interesting. It's very decentralized, almost in a sense. The Chicago outfit's so different than New York, where there was the the warring tribes, and you had to have the heads of those uh, different. Um, you know, mob families. That wasn't the case here. Well, we have crews, and, and they're very autonomous, uh, and capos of crews have a lot of power. Wouldn't you say, Kim uh, Yeah, I think there's a really good example of that with, uh, with Sam Battaglia, honestly. As he was making his way up to the top, there was another contemporary of his, Fiore Buccieri, Fifi Buccieri, and... That, now, there was some friction there, right, with those two correct, guys? Correct, correct. Buccieri honestly wanted the top spot. He, he coveted it and he was an equally violent guy, equally high money maker. He was, had a large footprint in the city and Jerry had a hard time staying in his own lane. He made a lot of inroads into the Chicago Heights, he, where Frank Laporte was, so he's trespassing down here. He's partnering up with the, the uh, North Chicago crew, the guys on Rush Street, to try and expand throughout the city. And he also starts stepping into Battaglia's territory. So 
Bujer is making all kinds of enemies, but I think he's also trying to, if he can take over enough of the city, then he thinks maybe he can force his way up to the top. So they're on the edge of a gossip of war. You've got two of the most powerful chieftains in the in the outfit now, Bujeri and Pataglia, and they've got armies of killers underneath both of them. So there's a big sit-down called with uh, with Rika and Ocardo, and this has got to get settled. Giancana's in prison, so... And these guys have seen this happen, right? They've seen this happen in the Capone era, where, you know, it, with both arm, everybody armed up, there's going to be a massacre if we don't do something. Yes. So, Aldericio is there, and he takes Bataglia's side, also. obviously, he's his guy, and uh, you've got another up-and-comer at the time, Joe Ferriola, Joe Nagal, who was a little bit younger than those guys, and a guy who we would, who definitely would come to be known later on in the in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mm -hmm. So Joe Nagal takes Bucieri's side. He's Bucieri's guy, and Aldricio jumps up and says, "I'll, I'll, what did you say? I'll, I'll tear you limb from limb. Tear you limb from limb in the middle of this sit down. I mean, it gets violent with these guys, and the gist of it is, Bucieri is sort of told to back off, and Battaglia gets the top spot. So it, it I think that. Jerry kind of got his hands slapped for stepping into other people's backyards. But I know that there was the, the issues with Chicago Heights, and I know he was trying to partner up with the, the guys up in uh, North, the North Loop and Rush Street. So you do see, like you were saying, a lot of that with these guys, without that strong centralized leadership, they're just, they're just warring factions around. They're, they're just warlords at different parts of the city. And they're going to have a go at each other. I think we get this idea that, like, well, it's just a mob and they're all working together and it's this giant pyramid scheme. But it's not really that case. I mean, these are these are a bunch of sociopaths who work with each other out of convenience, and if they can get by with killing one another, I mean, that's what they're going to do. And Bucieri would have come back for more, yeah. but he got stricken with cancer mm -hmm. and never really regained good health. Mm -hmm. So by the time that uh, Battaglia is going away, Bucieri was in no physical condition to vie for the top spot. Gotcha. And the veterinarian couldn't help him? Is that what <laughs> 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 I always go to the vet. Yeah. They Let's to get a bullet. We can't go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Before Battaglia died, he had one of his uh, crew members was Caifano, Marshal Caifano. And you'd mentioned that Caifano had been sent to Vegas. What was, what was his uh, objective there in the diversification? Now, we heard about the Sahara. And mob gets into the Sahara. What what else was Caifano up to out there? Well, he was purchasing a lot of real estate, purchasing it up for the Chicago outfit. He also was the overseer of the Chicago outfit's interests out there. He went by the name of John Marshall, rather than Marshall Caifano, which was very common, of course, amongst outfit members. They would anglicize their name, or they would take an Irish name for various reasons. And so he was the man's the outfit's man in Las Vegas for, for many, many years until uh, Tony Spilatro would come in the early 1970s. So he was sent by his long, lifelong friend, Sam Battaglia. They go back to the days of the 42s. So Caifano's out there doing the work for the outfit. And in the midst of it, he meets and tries to extort money from a oil man and known gambler named uh, Ray Ryan. So why is this significant? What, what's the story behind this? I mean, extortions, he did tons of extortions, all these guys did. So why did this one cause such a ruckus? Well, this one's a little special. I mean, Marshall Cafano was a known brute. And you've heard the old phrase that if you don't do what you're supposed to do in Vegas, you'll wind up like Russian Louis. And well, he was the one who buried Russian Louis in the desert, and he started that whole saying. So everyone was afraid of Marshal Cafano, and Ray Ryan had made the mistake of stealing a little bit of money from uh, Jimmy the Greek. And he tried to make amends. He paid back an enormous sum of money, but Cafano was not satisfied with that. And so he decided to push it a little bit further. He was going to extort him for what? It's like 60000 a year, which for the viewers, that's about a half a million. Uh, per year. Per that's a, year. That's a lot of money. For uh, protection. For protection. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to wind up like Russian Louis, I guess you pay the money. But Ray Ryan had a lot of guts. Well, Ray Ryan said, I'm not going to pay. And not only I'm not going to pay, what does he decide to do next? He, he rolled over, 
I mean, that was he. He informed. He spoke, and then you get you get uh, Caifano going away. So he gets convicted because of Ray Ryan. Because of Ray Ryan. Caifano gets convicted for extortion. Ten years he did. Ten years. And that's that's such a rough charge, extortion. I mean, it's such a basic thing to just go to somebody and and give me your money or else. But that was that was the scheme. And and, and Caifano's buying up real estate and running Las Vegas, and he gets busted on an extortion racket, which was kind of a stupid. Kind of, kind of a dunce kind of a thing when you're running sophisticated rackets and what you get busted on is threatening a guy for cash. Meanwhile, while he's in jail, this other guy, Ray Ryan, goes on, talk about diversification. He essentially finds, uh, starts all the real estate in Palm Springs, becomes friends with Clark Gable, becomes friends with William Holden, invests in uh, hotels in Kenya. I mean, this guy goes on to become like an international businessman investing money in different places, but he's got his tie back to the Chicago outfit yes. and uh, moves back to his hometown of Evansville, Indiana. And, and what happens next? Nothing good. Uh, he knows that the release of Marshall Cafano is coming and the ghost of Russian Louis is right behind Ray Ryan. So he reaches out through Tony Accardo directly and says, let's let bygones be bygones. Here's a million dollars. Well, Marshall Cafano gets out and says, I want permission to knock him down. It's denied, it's denied again, it's denied again. But they did take the million dollars. Didn't make Marshall Cafano any happier. He said, that guy cost me 10 years, I'm gonna knock him down. And <clears throat> according to, uh, I would just like to read this for the viewers, according to his uh, manner of demise, was a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device, which is also known as a car bomb. A car bomb. <laughs> but not an Irish car bomb. Don't. Not an Irish car bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no. His 1977 uh, Lincoln Mark V was blown 377 feet apart into where they found the vehicle had basically been a crater, and that was the end of Ray Ryan. As you say, the outfit never forgets. So Ryan's dead, blown to smithereens, literally. Um, what about Caifano? A lot of these guys, uh, you know, they, uh, we've talked about two people that have died in their 50s, 60s, suicide, die in jail, or die of cancer. What about Caifano? Well, Caifano's protectors in the outfit, his sponsors were Sam Giancana, Sam Battaglia. Both of the Sams were dead. The ruling council of the outfit at that time, Accardo, Aupa, and Alex, were engaged in wiping clean the outfit slate of any tint of Sam Giancana. And Marshall Cafano was shelved. He was just, you're done, you don't have any more rackets, uh, and you're done. It's kind of a gopher after that for different, for different characters. He was go around picking up money. He didn't really do much of anything. No, Lombardo actually yeah. allowed him to just run around and do errands for him, essentially, and that's what kept food on the table for Marshall Cafano mm -hmm. after all the years of being one of the most feared hitters in the outfit. Mm. And he lived to be 93. It, and he was always known as like a little guy, right? But he was tough. They said um, the head of the FBI, or well, former chief of the FBI, Jim Wagner, said uh, that he was a little guy who did the heavy work and did as much heavy work as, as Giancana or some of the other people. Probably more, he was a prodigious killer. He certainly was, and brutal. Uh, we see that throughout outfit history, the Napoleon Syndrome, where some of these, some of the most vicious criminals in the outfit, like Tony Spilatro, mm -hmm. like, Little Mickey Scarfa in Philadelphia. Like Mickey, Little yeah. Mickey, uh, like Marshall Cafano, who was so small, as a matter of fact, by the time he was 93, he had shrunk to under five feet. So when he finally passed away, they buried him in a child's coffin. That's bizarre. It's macabre. And uh, a John Cass, who uh, wrote for the Tribune, uh, commented on, on that when he, uh, he, he, covered the, um, he covered the funeral where he was greeted, as he said, by a, a, a kind man who said, we figured you newspaper people would be here. But, yeah, uh, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to cover the funeral. 
Um, but you know, for him to live to 93, it's got to be one, a record, pretty close to it. Yeah, not many do that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of those, it, the guys who came on the 42s with him, they all died relatively young of, of heart failure and, and different things. Battaglia, Alderisio, uh, Cincana didn't have heart problems, but his heart did stop. Uh, Fiore Buccieri died. Relatively young, you had a whole slew of guys in there who, who died within the early 70s, and it really wiped out a lot of the leadership. Caifano was sort of the last man standing of the old, sort of the old guard. He really was. By the time that he passed, there was nobody his contemporary. And 93, other than uh, Bonanno himself, who I think lived to be 99 or a, mm -hmm. 100, uh, you just you didn't see that. Yeah. Two words you don't hear often in the Chicago outfit. Natural death. Correct. And with that, let that be a reminder to you to watch episode seven next week on the VPod Network Inside the Chicago Outfit. Mm -hmm.